Welcome everybody. What an amazing day we've had today celebrating and learning about African and Caribbean foodways and what a fantastic way to end this brilliant day. I'm just so thrilled that this has been part of the food season. I remember three years ago we, we did a, a food season event on um, regional Indian food and in the audience somebody said why haven't you done anything on African or Caribbean food and I thought that is a real omission is a, that is that is right and it's wrong that we haven't and so it's been wonderful to have this day and to be working with this brilliant team so I really want to thank the food season team Angela Clutton guest director and Joe Allen uh, our food season assistant and general brilliant person and also Emma Peddy but around today, I especially want to think, thank Melissa Thompson because she has, she's a get food season director. She, she is really responsible for pulling together this incredible day and all these wonderful speakers who, speakers and food providers who just do so much to amplify and elevate and bring to the fore stories and histories and cultures about African food, Caribbean food, African and Caribbean diaspora food, as does this amazing panel that we've, we've got tonight. I mean, we're in for a treat. And I really want to also thank and introduce Nicole Rochelle Moore, who's our chair for, she's amazing, Nicole Rochelle. So I, I am just so pleased and proud to be able to say that Nicole Rochelle is my colleague at the British Library and she's also my friend. She um, is the curator for the Caribbean collections at the library. And I don't want to say that we didn't all have a lot of fun at the British Library before Nicole uh, Rochelle arrived <laughs> a year ago, but I tell you the laughter ratio has significantly <laughs> increased and I'm very grateful to her for that. She is great fun, but she's also incredibly expert and learned about all things Caribbean. Caribbean literature, Caribbean music, Caribbean history and life. She has deep connections with the George Padmore Institute, New Beacon Bookshop, her own book, Memories and Musings and Unfinished Conversations is coming out next year. So that's definitely something to look out for and it will be wonderful. She is, in fact, the, just the ideal host for, for, to, for today. So thanks so much, Nicole Rochelle. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Polly. What a fulsome um, introduction. Really fulsome. And so now, the <laughs> ladies. Hey. Hey. Really good to meet you all. Good vibes in the green room. Um, so, because some of you who know me know that I'm alphabetical OCD, like I, I've not been diagnosed, I've diagnosed myself. And, <laughs> oh God, so it's a thing, so it's going to be. Marie Mitchell is a writer, chef, and co-founder of the Island Social Club, which started off as a supper club. Pop's Kitchen was a Pop's supper kitchen. club, yeah, and then, and then I did Island Social Club. And then you kind of danced into, yeah. and we'll talk about that. <laughs> Marie's... Uh, Marie makes a considered effort to create space in which she can explore Caribbean culture and food with authenticity and without limits. And we were talking inside about how food really is very kind of cohesive and how it kind of brings people together and gets people to share. And we'll talk more about that. Developing dishes by focusing on history, geography and contemporary ingredients found in her locale and home, London. She's conscious of driving British Caribbean cuisine and this culture forward. She's a champion of social inclusivity, sustainability, and supporting and creating spaces for self-care and mental health awareness. She's due to publish her first book in spring 2024. Summer now. Summer. 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 I you love how bio just get things. You know how bio just get things wrong. And, and we're scrambling, we're scrambling. Caribbean recipes for the modern kitchen. I'm really looking forward, really it's looking okay. forward. Can you borrow your fan? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm just going, I can't believe I haven't got my yeah, fan. It's because I was sorry, late. <laughs> no, I always have a no, fan no, and no, I just I forgot. I was about you and the fan inside. I can't believe I did bring a fan. You don't and you have a flat. Buckle up, buckle up is all I'm saying. Um, yes. Love you. Pin... <laughs> I'm trying to be really professional. <laughs> oh, no. I'm so sorry. I'm so trying. Wow. Polly, are you still happy that you're asking? <laughs> 
Um, yes, and so Kin will be out next year, summer, and it will celebrate the powerful connection food gives us to our families, culture, to places and people around the world. So hands together, please. Sounds great. Next up, do I need to introduce <laughs> <laughs> Andy Oliver, known to us all as host of both oh. the BBC's Great British Menu and the Sky <laughs> Arts Book Club, woohoo! <laughs> Amongst numerous other media roles, um, and in the recent production for BBC Two, The Caribbean with Andy and Makita, Andy and her daughter embarked on an emotional journey to explore their heritage. And Andy's first book, Pepper Pot Diaries, Tales from My Caribbean Table, was published last month, showcasing traditional and modern dishes. It reveals the flavors of Andy's childhood and tracks how Caribbean cuisine has evolved over, you see me? Give her back her fair. No, no, I'll, I'll sacrifice for her. No, no, we share, we're gonna share. <laughs> <laughs> and in, no <laughs> in November, 2022, Andy was appointed a patron of the Oxford Cultural Collective. Andy Oliver. Um, and just, just very quickly, another round, because yesterday was her boosty big round. Oh, now. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. You. Now you're talking. Where did that come from? It. Thank you. Let me see the colour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you're good with that. You're good with that. Do you want it back? Nice. This is beautiful. Oh, wow. Stronger. Um, Melissa Thompson. Yay. Our lady here. Woo. <laughs> Melissa Thompson is an award-winning food writer, columnist, and cook, a former national newspaper journalist. In 2014, she started a supper club in her front room that eventually became a sellout pop-up. As a food writer, she has penned powerful articles on the British food industry that became focal points for important discussions around identity, diversity, and inclusivity. And in 2021, she won the Guild of Food Writers Food Writing Award, and last year was named Writer of the Year at the PPA Awards. And I did remind myself what it stands for, but what does it stand for again? Oh, I can't ask you that, I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's something like publishing. It's publishing something. I mean, Premier, it's very important. Premier. Yes. <laughs> very important. Primary publishing Ported. award. Important yeah. publishing. It <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That is the one. And as a kid, so just Google it, right? Um, her debut cookbook, Motherland, was published by Bloomsbury in 2022. It explores the evolution of Jamaican food from the island's indigenous population to today and it was shortlisted for the Andre Simon Award in 2023, very important award. She is a regular panelist on Radio 4's The Kitchen Cabinet. I heard you last week. Oh, lovely. Has appeared on Saturday Kitchen and is co-director, as Polly said, of the British Library's food season. She's a columnist for BBC Good Food magazine and has written articles and recipes for a wide range of publications, including The Guardian, Condé Nast Traveller, Waitrose Weekend, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Thompson. Okay, so um, I uh, said yes, happily, but these things always come, you know, the questions. I'm very glad that, you know, I was able to kind of think of, they seem easy peasy, but they're going to be, I want them to be springboards for a rich discussion. And so to each of you, I ask now, what are your earliest influences, memories of food and cooking? So on. Marie, let's start. Earliest memory will be cooking, baking with my nan. Yes. Uh, in her kitchen in Earlsfield in South London. Mm -hmm. uh, and always, I think the visual memory is always just seeing um, fruit soaking for the fruitcakes. <laughs> always. Like perennial. <laughs> it's a perennial soup, right? Yes. I mean, wow. she had eight children. And then by that point, I think there were probably about 20-ish grandchildren. And she used to make one for every single one of our birthdays. <gasps> Like every single birthday, except I got two because I didn't like fruit cake at the time. <laughs> so then she would make me a sponge cake with lemon icing. Oh, great. Were you one of the younger ones? Yeah, ish. <laughs> <laughs> Spiled. <laughs> in it. In it. <laughs> Technically more mid range now. <laughs> 
probably say really, uh, my dad, he used to love cooking a Sunday dinner. Right. And, but like our Sunday dinner was not a Sunday roast. It was like, yeah, you know, rice and peas, hard food, yeah. planting. And I'd probably say that's probably one of my like core memories of when I would watch his, because on Sunday that was his day. He would yeah, do the cooking yeah. then. And so I'd probably see the, the pleasure that he used to derive from cooking that. And that was kind yeah. of like what got me into yeah. the book. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, because uh, someone came into New Beacon Books recently, a young man who had visited Trinidad and talked about how he was shamed into learning how to cook because he realized that men in Trinidad just cook and cook and cook. You know, Caribbean men really cook a lot. Yeah. You know, it may not, it's not a widely known thing, but they really do. Mm. Andy, earliest? It's interesting because my dad was a cook as well. He used to cook. He was. He was. My mum did more of the everyday cooking, yeah. mm -hmm. and my dad did more of the use everything in the house, every single pot, make a lot yeah. of mess. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really good, yeah. really good. Kind of worth it, maybe in the long run, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to, kind of thing. But I, I think I get the because part of the question is that the influences mm. I certainly get from my father, the desire to have a table full of heaving, mm. yes. full of loads of different yeah. things. Loads of, he would never make two things. He would always make at least always 10 things. things. There was always a whole bunch of stuff happening. And he would like, uh, he would he would engage me and my brother. So he would never buy like black eyed peas just dried in a, in a bag like a normal person. <laughs> he would get them still wet oh. in, the, in the sack and then bring them home, and then we would have to shell the peas. Oh. And I just was furious about it. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? And now I am that person, yeah. <laughs> you know. And he would take me going to the market with my dad. It was, he, was because he was a terrible father, but he was good at certain things in his life. And those, the joy that he got from those things really stayed with me, you know. So he had a whole uh, market, going to the market strategy. So you start at the beginning, you go through, but you don't buy. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. It's very important. Yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. buy. Because yeah. so, because otherwise you could buy two avocados and you see when, them and, and there's then you three, see them down the three yeah, for the true, same price. There's true. nothing more annoying. Yeah, I hate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So you start at the beginning, you work your way down and then you go back and you buy on uh -huh. the way back. And it was only about 15 years ago, I thought, oh, my God, I'm doing it. Because <laughs> it used to really annoy me when I was a kid. And then I realised that's how I it shop, makes you know. A lot of sense. And then I guess in terms of actually really cooking in the kitchen, I started making like the college. It's interesting you bring up the Sunday lunch because that's such a familial gathering time. And those are the things that really have affected me and stayed with me. I mean, the, my book is lit like the way we cook, mm -hmm. that thing about bringing people together, unification. It's kind of key to even how things taste, I think, and what goes in the pot and how it goes in the pot. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you need to long things out because there's 25 people in your way. But you've got this yeah, much yeah, meat. Yeah. But um, my mum was, I taught, I, she taught me how to make cauliflower cheese when I was about six. Or something. I remember standing on the on the stool, you know, and, and, and cooking. I learned how to make a bechamel or, or a mornay, and uh, making the cauliflower cheese, and just seeing that thing that this simple thing could turn into this bubbling, you know, burnished beauty was it really, really stayed with me, just that it was that easy to do, you know. Mm. And when she was, well, by the time I was 12, I was making Sunday. I well, read about you and Dinner parties, throwing dinner parties I mean, at what, 12. Yeah, what Aww. a weirdo. What a weirdo. <laughs> My friends were like, what? <laughs> so you were just kind of saying to your friends, come round for dinner. Come <laughs> round for dinner. I'm roasting a chicken. They were like, wow. <laughs> I want to play hopscotch. What, <laughs> what is the matter with the bird? They like that chicken. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. But yeah, no, I do, yeah, oh, wow. so, yeah, so I think the things that stayed with me with that flamboyance and just the, just the, how you can affect the lives of people around you yeah. mm. with something you've made. Mm -hmm. It's connectivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Totally. I mean, you've spoken about how much, I mean, in interviews about how much you love feeding people and yeah. having people love your I'm food. I'm a feeder for sure. You're a feeder. Yeah, I'm a feeder. You're a feeder. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Sun, earliest memories, influences? Uh, I guess like quite quite a few different ones. So, so things that, that really stick out are, and, and the sort of smell like forms quite a, quite a lot of them, I guess. My um, 
uh, like my dad, because we lived in Hong Kong, my dad was in the Navy, so we lived in Hong Kong for a couple of years, and I remember he used to cook this dish, and I asked him about it recently, because I couldn't remember. It might be like chicken in, like, in, with black beans, or it might be this pork dish, and I remember it, at some point in the cooking, it smells quite unpleasant. And um, mm. and, and I'd always go to the same thing, because you're a kid, right? And so, like, 10 minutes feels like a lifetime. Mm. And so at the beginning of it, I'm like, oh, God, like, what's he cooking? I really don't want to eat it. And then I'd sit down to eat it, and I'd be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, give me more. <laughs> and it took me ages to make that connection, that that thing that I didn't like turns into this amazing thing. And it's always that like, part of the alchemy, or, like, or like kind of the... The, the kind of the, the like it's a, it's a really important lesson about kind of the journey that a dish will take right and mm. in some guys is it's almost like painting kind of like trust the process it's going to mm. be okay mm -hmm. um i guess like my mum's lasagna um which was always different to different like lasagna um friday nights having burgers and chips and baked beans which is like kind of the most like british thing we ever ate and how it, al it would always give me indigestion like and, and nothing else would and i was like a kid right kids shouldn't get indigestion but i guess it's because yeah. it's like really quite processed and then, like traveling up to Darlington, where my dad's family had um, settled, and um, and like just when they were like, "Oh, we're going to Darlington from Weymouth," and it's like a six-hour journey. It was rubbish, right, for a kid. So I'm sure it wasn't that much better for my parents. And um, and the only thing that would keep me going is knowing that my my grandma's curry chicken um, yes. would, would be waiting this, for me. You say this, you and it is like yeah. it's it was it was just it was so good. And it, and like you know, like when you're going in for the pot, right? So first of all, you know, you you go for like. Um, I don't know, for like a bit of thigh or something. And then like, on your third helping, you're down to like sort of like literally Nuckle. skin and bones. <laughs> and it's like, it will do. It will do kind of with the, with the, the rice yeah, and peas. The rice, yeah. And then I, I guess the first time that I, I remember cooking, I mean, I, I, I used to help out with bits, like I'd be like rolling dumplings or something and things like that. So I, I, Aki and Saltfish as well was kind of like a process. And I, and I wrote about this in, in Motherland. So because we lived in Weymouth, which is just like, there was no kind of like sort of mm. like a Caribbean community to speak of really, apart from like the Thompson family. Um, and then like, <laughs> so, you know, a, like a tin of ackee. So like, I mean, it's still like what, five pound 50 for a tin of ackee. So like a, a, like a portion of ackee and salt fish would revolve around this tin of ackee. Cause like, there's no way they're opening two tins for this. So that kind of be the, the thing <laughs> that, that's, like, that's gonna determine how much you get to eat. And then you've got like your salt fish. And so like mum would be on like dumpling duty and I'd be like watching her making sure she's making enough. Cause it's the only thing that you could scale up yeah. really. And it's like, all right, sort me out mum kind of thing. And then, um, and then when my dad, he went, um, he uh, served in the first, first Gulf War and I was like, I'm gonna make my mum a roast dinner. Um, so this is, was it like 92? So I would have been 11. And, um, and I was like, I came home from school and I was like, yeah, I can make a roast dinner in like, what, in like an hour. And um, I took a chicken out of the freezer and tried to like defrost oh. it in the microwave. Wow. <laughs> All I'll say is that we didn't eat the roast dinner that night. <laughs> and, um, but my mum was like quite decent she, about it. She appreciated the sentiment. Yeah, there, totally. The yeah, totally. Right? And, and I think like my, my, my dad is never, even today, like my dad will be stressing. I'm like, dad, can I help you? But no, no, I've got it. Oh my god! Like oh let me. Like, and, but I'm I am in danger of turning into the same person. So like, and, and so, you become oh, it's so bad. Do you not become <laughs> imperious in the kitchen? Yes. You, I read in your book. Yeah. <laughs> tired. You could be tired, tired, tired. <laughs> but you're going home yeah, and you're cooking, cooking and you're just. Yeah. Well, it helps me relax. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? It's like, so it's a different, it's a different bits of me are tired. Mm -hmm. So my yeah. brain might be tired, but yeah. my body needs to cook yeah. right. to unwind. Because I, I, when I'm really tired like that, I can't actually just lie down straight no. away because it's too so much. It's through. So true. Yeah, so, so if I cook, it helps me breathe back in. It's like I land back in my body again, even yeah. if it's something very, very simple. Mm -hmm. Just the process of doing it and making yourself something that's going to be good for your body or good for the people around you, it, it well, kind of reconnects me with myself as well. And just speaking of tired, let's just put hungry and tired together. And I'm going to say I'm like rubbish if I'm hungry. If I'm really hungry, cooking is like, oh God, I can't, I just like, it's going to, it's going to not take, it's not going to be good. Do any of you cook when you're hungry? Like yeah. when you're hungry. Oh God, I'm so yeah. hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I, yes. but I have yes. things, I have things in my, I've got an emergency dumpling freezer. <laughs> to be honest, I have that with roti, I've rolled yeah. them, so you can roti. just take them out and fry. You just got to, you've got to, you've got to think stuff. ahead, you've got to think stuff. ahead. I mean, my thing is, and I don't know, yeah, one of my good colleague sisters is in the audience and she knows, like, she, I'll say, yeah, I'm like really hungry, I'm just going to go and have some porridge. 
Oh, two eggs. That's me. Don't look at me. Don't judge me. <laughs> it's too late. Don't it's judge. too late. It's already happened. <laughs> if, I, if I'm cooking, um, and I'm, uh, so that is the longest my hunger will go unchecked for because I know that I've got a reward at the end of it. And yeah. so uh, otherwise I'll just end up just, like snacking on something. But mm. well, if I'm cooking snack, something, I'll, yeah. still, I'll snack as I'm cooking. But it's, I want to know, know that I've got enough space. Better. <laughs> You need yeah. it. But yeah, it I just wanna... depends on what it is. So I have things like I have a jar of green seasoning. Do people, everybody know what green seasoning is? We all know, yeah. Right. So I have a jar of green seasoning in my fridge at all times. Green seasoning because, all the time. because, because when you're tired and you've got to cook, uh, for people who don't know, it's like garlic, herbs, and some chilies and some oil and some things, them that you would need. <laughs> you just have to work it out. You have to kind of to make work the food it to nice. suit your, yeah. So everybody has their own version. And yeah. I have a jar of that in the fridge all the time mm. because the thing you can't be bothered to do is like peel garlic. Yes. Like who's doing when that? you're yes. tired and all of that. Yes. So if you've got yeah. that, then you can do anything. You get pieces, you can steak, a bit of fish, even a bit of tazza, even some scrambled eggs, and you can make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, listen, level. I put stuff in. I am. Um, yeah, yeah. I've got the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made a Kalaloo and saltfish shakshuka the other day. Oh, it was banging. Oh, yum. Banging. Anyway, that's, I digress. Well, I mean, I, I really do like when people who cook are confident to say, and they mean it, it's genuine, like, that was really good. Like, for, you know, as Andy said, it was banging. My terminology is, oh, my God, it was a marry myself job. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. And it, yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Like curries sometimes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> that next day yes. thing. Oh, that next day next thing. Day. You make a nice yeah. curry and always it's good. Everything yeah. has... And then the next day when it's had time to yeah. have a little chat yeah. with itself. Yeah. yeah. Hang out overnight. The it's word, been out yeah. on a date. You know it's what been, I mean? <laughs> my granddad would say, you just leave it, let it kusume. And it's so Aye. Good. Let it kusume. And Aye. it's good. It's good. Mm. So, let's talk a little bit about the journeys that you made that got you to professional chef. Um, Marie, every time I've read about you, it's like, is she <laughs> in fashion? Or is it <laughs> I was in fashion, but it's just like we're kind of skimming over a little more, a little more. Fashion, Andy, oh my God, the punk band. The yeah. punk band. And other things, but the punk band. <laughs> <laughs> Please let the audience know what the band was called. And Melissa, journalism. And um, yeah, like you'd fallen out of love with that boy. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna, she, they're going to share. So Marie, let's... <laughs> we'll give I'm her coming, a moment. I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> we'll give her a moment. Uh, Marie. I've had many hats, to be fair. Mm. I was like fashion, nanny, retail, like... I've, mm. I've dabbled in many things. The fashion one was, I, I definitely thought was going to be my career. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I spend last portions of the year where my eye won't stop twitching. And, okay. and this but what, what, I mean, what were you doing? What well, you... I, I started off as like a um, production manager in a shoe business. Mm. And I loved it because I was learning so much about shoes. And I kind of dabbled in a bit of the shoemaking, not very good at it at all. Um, <laughs> And then slowly, I was just given more and more responsibility and actually was running the business for them, but not being paid very well. Mm. And um, it was inc a really good learning curve for understanding how to run a business. But for me, I was like, I just don't care about shoes this much mm -hmm. to be this mm -hmm. stressed about it. <laughs> um, and then was just like, well, I love food, but I'm not sure how I want to do that or how I want to get into it. So I just took some time out and started nannying because mm -hmm. I'd kind of always done that while I was studying. And from that, I then met my boss, who was a huge influence because I was looking after her children. And she was just like, you're so good with food. You need to do something with it. And then I started my That's supper club. Time. Yeah. With my parents, which was great. I mean, you talk about um, in some of the readings I've done, you talk about obviously your dad and you spoke mm. about your dad just now about being, I mean, he has the passion for cooking. Yes. Your mum didn't have that much passion she didn't for have cooking, the passion. but we'll talk about... She was about, good at it. Yeah. But she had but no she didn't, passion. Yes. No. And so, but but you describe her so evocatively, like, so warm and just so welcoming and stuff. So I can imagine when you did Pop's Kitchen, you yeah. say, you know, your mum was the hostess. Yes. Yeah. And your dad was in the kitchen. Yeah. Helping you in the kitchen. And I'm sure that worked so well. It was really special. And it was... It, it was after, it was a couple of years, two, no, 
about six years after my brother died. And I think it was really the first time since he'd passed where I felt as if we were a family again, where we were solidly a family. It was mm -hmm. if that pillar w that was missing by having this thing that we were able to share in and be able to share that with others kind of reformulated our community mm. and that in itself reformed you know ours and I think I hadn't given enough thought about how special that was until kind of more recently yeah. but it definitely was a really really beautiful thing that kind of brought us back to ourselves a little bit which it had its time yeah it had its time and yeah. its purpose right yeah Andy Oliver. That really resonates with me, what you're saying, because I lost my brother when I was about 25, actually, and I lost my... I lo cooking stopped being a safe sp place for me. Mm. Mm. For a while, I developed all sorts of illnesses and eating disorders and all sorts of stuff, and so the thing that I'd loved kind of almost became the, the, the scary on. place. Yeah. And it was when I started loving cooking again that I knew I was kind of coming through. It's very interesting yeah. to me that you're talking about... Um, your love of food, reconnecting your family and sharing it with other people because it kind of did the same thing for me. Yeah. Mm. I think it's such a powerful thing and people talk about the power of food all the time, mm. but you kind of, it, it's got, in quite a kind of surface way. Yeah. Or they talk about the power of food to unite and you think, what do you mean? Mm. But it really is it a yeah. visceral gut thing, yeah. isn't it? Really deeply. Yeah. Um, sorry, I can't remember what your question was. Your because I got, I got <laughs> taken by what you were saying. Yeah, I was really no. thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, the origins, you know, right, like, gotcha. Yeah, so yeah. just, you know. Well, so I guess for me, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to really track it mm. because I've always cooked, like I said, you know, since I was little, I've been cooking. And, and then I started, I, I fell into things most of my life, do you know what I mean? I didn't really ever have any plan. Mm -hmm. And like you, and like you, many different hats, uh, singing, acting, dancing really a bit, kind of, um, you know, worked in receptionist at some uh, a record company at one point, had several different bands. I was in a band called Ripping and Panic with That's the one. Um, Nana Cherry, who's like my best mate. Yeah. And that was <laughs> really, you know, pivotal for me. And our relationship mm -hmm. in food is very pivotal for me because we... I grew up in Suffolk. My dad was in the RAF, again, like, you know, it's in the forces kind of thing, and only black girl in the school, all of that stuff. And Nana was in southern Sweden, also having a, quite a weird time. It was the 70s, you know, before the lights went on, I always say. It was like everything was a bit grey and corrugated iron, and it was all a bit, mm. no thanks. And uh, the National Front were having a great time. It was a weird time, you know. Mm. And then I came to London, and I met Nana... And we started cooking together. And we were cooking together, I think, in the way that we were. Uh, we were discussing this the other day because we needed community mm. and we needed family. So even though we were having these parties and putting on these raves and doing all this stuff and having these warehouse parties, we were still making chicken. Again, a bit weirdo. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were having these massive raves and me and Nana were in the back sousing 25,000 mackerel. It's like... <laughs> 17 so it's like just buy the cider and drink it like everybody else <laughs> <laughs> well, why are you sousing mackerel because but, you were 12 and because, throwing dinner parties yeah, because i was 12 and throwing dinner parties. but i you know <laughs> i really thought profession. about it because we laugh about it a lot and i thought what was that though and i think we both had a real desire to pull people together around us so yeah. that we, f we felt safe, yeah. so mm. that we felt connected. Because, you know, you could leave home really young in those days. We were, when I met Nana, I was 17, she was 16, we were kids. I'm just like, I, can I just say, like, I meet people in this country. I mean, I say this country as though I don't live here. But I did, <laughs> I did, I mean, now I've lived here more than I've lived in Trinidad. Yeah. But I mean, I did a lot of my growing up, right? Back, back and forth, Trinidad. I'm like, when people say they left home at 60, and I'm shocked. I'm like, what? I couldn't wait. What did your parents say? You know, I'm really kind of like, because in Trinidad, we're home. Yeah. We're home. You're doing your A-levels, you're home. You're, you know, you might be going to uni. You're home. I left school when I was 16. Right. The moment I was allowed to leave school, I was out there. I couldn't do it very well. I wasn't good at school. Um, I, I think my education really started after I oh, left school. Oh, I, yeah. I, mean, I read voraciously my whole life. I just hated being at school, so I just school educated myself. School really myself. bad for education, but actually. My whole family are teachers. My mum's a teacher. My uncle's a headmaster in London. You know, mm. so I come from this family of teachers, and I'm one of the only people in my 
family who didn't go to university. I mm. just didn't, it just didn't work for me. I'm going to tell a lie, but it's, you'll know who I'm talking about. You talk about some cousin of yours in the book and um, you said, well, actually, you're wrong. I mean, you might be a rocket scientist, but you're oh. wrong about this. She's not a rocket scientist, is she? No, she's Aunt Althea. She's a, she's a professor right, at Harvard. Yeah, <laughs> she's, yeah. She is quite so fancy. Yeah. <laughs> she's quite fancy. She's still wrong about the dumpling. She's I can't remember what we're arguing about. She's wrong. And I, in the I book, agree. I said, it's not me, it's my cousin, but I know it's me. So <laughs> look at you. Aunt Althea, right? We're all scared of her, basically. <laughs> so um, anyway, so, so Nana and I were always cooking. You know, right. we were cooking to keep the around the band we were cooking when we'd come back off tour we were cooking like when other bands would come here early hip-hop days you know um like fab five freddy and all those future or two thousand all those boys would come they were starving they needed chicken we used to make them chicken because <laughs> you couldn't get stuff then you know you no. couldn't even get a cold beer in a fridge it was like the fridges in the shops didn't work it was all that did you ever come mess. and eat at wkd oh in camden yeah did I go to that place? Did you go? Did you ever eat there? No. Don't say anything bad about the food, you know. No, no, no. Uh -huh. No, I just wasn't sure if you meant the weird yeah, blue drink. Yeah, or yeah, if you yeah. meant the weird <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a funny drink? W yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if you yeah. meant the place or the Oh, drink. no, the place, the place. No, no. Okay. Um, so, anyway, so we've got, and then, and then, you know, years go past, and then somebody offered Nana and I a cooking show. So we did a cooking show on BBC Two. And then after that, I started doing supper clubs. So I thought, I, I, I like this. Right. And I'd been doing, there was a place just in off Labrick Grove called The Globe, mm -hmm. which was like a kind of speakeasy. Mm -hmm. And it was at the end of my road. And I started cooking chicken and rice and peas and roast pumpkin and hard food and all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And then the mash people at 2 a.m. were like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually making food, food, yeah. you know, because this place used to shut at like six in the morning. So that was the first place anybody paid me for food. But the, but, but the television show... How came long? after. That, that came, came after. after. That came quite a long time after. Oh, OK. But I was always, you know, and it was... I think also, you know, I, was, I had a kid when I was 20, mm -hmm. which is young-ish. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I had no money. I was a single parent. So it was like I realised that with five pounds, if you could buy chicken wings and rice and some salad, you had a party mm. and you could do things and you could make community so mm -hmm. it was like it's just a way of me making broader mm -hmm. reaching out family for me and my daughter mm -hmm. and just that's just what we always did I don't mm -hmm. remember not doing it so mm -hmm. you know I people talk to me about oh were you trained I'm like mm, yeah but not by anybody yeah. else yeah. <laughs> if you see what yeah. I mean it kind of came but in terms of but you remember distinctly as you said just now when you first got paid, paid. for cooking that was that was in the globe that yeah. was in the globe and then yeah. I and I was setting bananas on fire with rum and whipped cream and right. they were like what in this like little hole in the wall <laughs> Like, I was having a great range. time. Yeah, of I just course. was like, oh, there's a huge range. It was the first time I had a range Oof. cooker. And I was like, oh, my right. God, there's eight hobs. Oh, <laughs> yes. It's huge. Yeah, so, that's the kind of thing that you say, excite my brother. That's, that's exciting. Eight hobs. Like, eight oh, eight oh, hobs. Kind of Nirvana. Double yeah. so I could get a load in there. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So, so it's it's a funny. Mm. Uh, it's hard for me to it's really. Never, yeah, I mean these, the, you know, these journeys are not linear. I mean, I don't think yeah. they are for some people. Like, I don't yeah, think so. Know, I don't think journey. so. Linear. So that's almost like a pop up residency, like but but, but before yeah. pop ups. And yes, like, before they were up, called they? that. Yeah, yes, right. it, yeah. was, wow. it was. It was. It was an extension of my sitting room. It was down the road. My friend was running it. And then we all used to run the place anyway. Mm. And it was just one of them. They, you, you, I mean, some posh kids bought it now. Some posh kids' mum bought it for them. Apparently, it's £14 for a vodka. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all like, in the glow! <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was like sticky carpet joint, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, no one's paying nothing for a vodka. Yeah, it's so funny, huh, when you kind of see... Like, I lived in Finsbury Park, Stroud Green Road. Like, I look at Stroud oh, yeah. Green Road... Divey, but yeah. now people. I worked in the World's End. On there. Did you work in the World's yeah, End? Yeah, back in the day. day. I used to freak. I know. Them. That was I know. Divey. I love a dive. I miss them. Was there a World? Is there a World's End in Camden still? Oh, that big pub on the corner. Yeah, oh, God, that's divey. Yeah, that's that's well. that's beyond divey. That's still divey. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's <laughs> dark. <laughs> I like that. I like that one. Is yeah. it in like, Camden? But like the one in because it's a football pub and it was a bit. Oh, a bit. Yeah. Bit rough. Anyway, tell us. Thank you. Tell us about your 
Yeah. How did you? So journalism was. Yeah. So I, but, uh, yeah. I mean, like, exactly like Andy said. Like I never really had, a, you know, a plan. I didn't really know what I was doing. I signed up to some business degree. Of, uh, all I wanted to do was come to London. I wanted to come to London, oh. and um, and then I, and I was doing this business degree, and I hated it so hard. But, and I feel it. And I, and I honestly, like, I only stopped having the anxiety dreams about economics because I, I had an economics met module, and I, I never went to any lectures. And, um, and I, I like up until about five years ago, I was still having anxiety dreams. Like I had an economics exam tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't gone to any of my economics lectures. And I kept being like, I'll go, but I couldn't bring myself to go. And then I started speaking to some journalism students. And, and, um, and they were like, and I, I'd never thought, I mean, my parents like bought the Daily Mail, right? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I was just like, journalism was never like a paper, newspapers. It was like, what? And, and it, that was about like telling people's stories. And, and that really appealed to me. So then I spoke to the course director. I happened to be at a really good a university that had a really good journalism school. And he let me swap onto it, and then, um, and, and I, I was just a bit kind of, you know, like sort of like I guess slacking it sort of back in the day. And I, I went to after uni, went back to Weymouth, and um, and worked in the local paper, the Dorset Echo. And that was really transformative for me because a, it stopped me from really hating Weymouth, where I came from, because it was like, you know, I stuck out. Like, and, and I also went to secondary school in Suffolk, right? In, right. Uh, so in you Holbrook, so feel my pain. Oh my yeah. God, strongly. It was, it was strongly. It was tough. Yeah, so tough. Um, and um, and, and I, I'd go like all around the county, and it's like before sat now, so I'd just get lost in different places, and I'd speak to a lot of different people, <laughs> including people doing food. Started doing like a food column there called Taste, and just like speaking, like you know, I went to an abattoir. I'd go like fishing. I'd go and I went like deer stalking, and was like you know like skinning a deer in the middle of a field and stuff like this. And it was like proper, like it was just, it was just it, like interesting and seeing where like your food comes from and like cheese makers and like all different things like that. And, um, and I tried to get a job in London um, and tried to get, like, get a job in like food publications and, um, and, and didn't. So then I had kind of this like, weird kind of route back into kind of like journalism. Ended up at the Mirror. Um, and if anyone's, um, yeah, in fact, no, I won't, yeah. I won't say that. So I ended up at the Mirror, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Well done. I mean, <laughs> yeah, thank you. See? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I remember my legal training. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then um, and, I, and so that, that was it. And, but then when I started, I lost the love. I would um, I, I started a supper club. And my, my sister in law is Japanese, and she made this um, karage chicken, right? It was like oh. Japanese fried chicken. Mm. And 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 and, like, oh, and also, I mean, back so when I was in, in Weymouth, so like you know, I'm a bit of a rubbish drinker. Like I like a drink, but my body doesn't like it, so I would just fall asleep. Like when you leave journalism, they, they do you a mock up of the front pages, and mine alludes to the fact that like, oh, they came to me for comment, but I was in a corner sleeping. <laughs> 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 so my idea, so I'd get people around for like dinner, right, all the time, because at least it would like prolong the evening yes. quite a, a little bit, and it would like line my stomach, and um, and so like making like you know kind of big bats. So and, and I I would drive back because I, I studied in London, so I'd, I'd drive back up to London to go and see my mates, and then and then take like loads of stuff back in the car to go and cook stuff like goat and all this sort of stuff, and um, and then and then because I hated like. But like journalism, I, um, I I started a supper club and I was making this karage chicken like for me and my mates all the time, and I was like, this is getting a bit ridiculous. And I saw a, a thing about like starting a supper club, um, and so I was like, well, I, I put myself onto it, and it was like, what am I going to cook? I know I'll cook um, uh, karage uh, chickens. So that was always a basis, and it kind of like turned into like Japanese comfort food. And then I, I kind of reached a bit of a crossroads. So I was like, where am I going to where am I going to take this right? Because you know, I, I've, I've said this before, like. Um, What's the word when you, you kind of feel out of place um, and you, you sort of question yourself? I can't remember, is that that expression? Imposter. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. And, and actually, oh, syndrome. sometimes it's almost a bit like it can be like a valid, like, ding, 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 right? You know, I mean, uh, like, mm. but, but I, I, I have that anyway. But, but in this, like, that, that wasn't, because I, I, you know, I had a meeting with an agent about writing a book about Japanese comfort food, and I was like, I shouldn't be the person writing mm. this book, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I had a daughter, and that was kind of an excuse to kind of, like, leave what I was doing. And then, so now, I guess, yeah, I, then I started, I mean, writing more about kind of other issues and I fell back in love with journalism because it's like actually you know I can write about what I want, to, want write to write about, about yeah. and what I think has value rather than being told to write certain things and, and it being yeah and, and being and being framed in a certain way which is kind of you know like I mean mainstream media is kind of like it is like a bit racist mm -hmm. right and, and and having to write things through the lens of your editors who are typically white middle-aged um, uh, middle class at a bare minimum men who don't understand these things. And, and I was like, all right, actually, journalism can be a force for good and it can be nice, which I kind of knew from the beginning, but this is kind of like a bit of a realization. Mm. And, um, and, then, and then, you know, and, and then obviously, like, I do a lot of barbecue stuff. So it's all, everything's just all kind of come together and kind of, um, I guess, informs 
yeah. everything else and, and yeah. it feels it feels like I still don't know what I'm doing where I'm going but I'm just kind of enjoying, enjoying the ride enjoying yeah. I mean I think like one of the things I say to myself I say to my children a lot nothing goes for naught yes everything, that we everything, do, is, everything is something everything is something that leads to it's leading yeah. to something and if you do every, if you mean everything if you, you do mean it, yeah. and and give it everything you have you will learn something from mm. every single thing you do yes. every single everything thing. Yeah. I, I, and, and i think having that attitude as well makes it, like all the bad bits of your life makes them kind of you view them less negatively because yes. they've informed what you're doing yes. and, and even like they, and they've had they help yeah, i mean yeah, they, you know you yeah i mean i can go on i mean you know that kind of attitude of gratitude thing is yeah. it's important thing, yes it's, it's important. like really important yeah. for life and living it's reframing isn't it yes yeah, yeah. yeah. really really yeah. speaking of attitude of gratitude and turning looking at at difficulties and challenges and so on i want to just go on to that um because you both spoke about losing siblings um losing your brothers and I wanted to ask about the role that food has played, Andy, you have mm. spoken a bit, the role that food has played in grief and loss in both your lives. And Maria, I know you're, you're, you know, we, we, and we don't have to stay long. No, no, you know, um, but, um, huh? yeah, both times it's tethered me back. And oh. my mum died a couple of years ago. Uh, just before my daughter was born. Mm. And when you were talking about how it, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't cook, that's how I had for months. Mm. Um, and I think that's why I've, I found writing the book <coughs> that I just recently finished, well, mm -hmm. stage, finishing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, <coughs> particularly brutal initially because it was very exposing. Mm. Um, and it meant I had to confront things that I'd pretty much had to bury because, you know, my mum died three weeks before Marcy was born, my daughter, and we all had COVID and I almost died from it. And so there was like this very, very intense mm. trauma that happened. Mm. And food is always centred around joy for me. And I wasn't... I. It's not that necessarily I wasn't allowing myself. I just couldn't you access couldn't, joy. Yeah. I couldn't access yeah. it. So food de definitely just became something that was functional so that I could then sustain myself and feed my child. Yeah. Um, but more recently, it's really come back round. Yeah. And I think that's... I think it's it's not that I'm fine. It's that no. I'm now able to access what happened mm. and I'm able to process it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for food for that yeah. because I think... For me, it's a chance to have really important conversations, whether that's with myself or with other people mm -hmm. that maybe are not always able to have mm -hmm. because we all have to do it. We all yeah. have to engage in it. And I think it's that's what is so special about it. And mm -hmm. I think when people say it can unify, I think that's, you know, for me, it's unified me again. It's kind yeah, of brought it's me. It's brought you, it's gathered you back to yourself. Exactly. Right? And, um, yeah. and thank you for sharing your that's mum's roost. Yeah, your your mum's roast recipe. It's still one of my favourites. <laughs> Andy, so it's fracture. Yeah, yeah. It's fracture, mm -hmm. isn't it? Since you're saying it brought the, p the different disparate parts of yourself back together again. When my brother died, I broke into a million pieces. I was 25. He was 27. He had sickle cell anemia. It was really a massive shock, and it, it, you know, one minute he was there, and the next minute he was gone, and we couldn't believe it. You know, it was like the world stopped, mm. my world stopped, and everything else kept going. Yeah, you know, and I was kind of looking it's so around insulting. Me. It's a kind of you well, feel yeah. kind of like what the hell you know, and it's wrong. meant to be like that. That's what it's yeah. like because everybody has to get on with their lives, but it's yeah. so I, you're so, it's so isolating mm. because you don't know how to put one foot in front of the other. And then I started to, disordered eating became a part of my life and it was horrible for me because it had been the thing that I expressed joy, I expressed love and it suddenly, it felt like that thing had turned against me. You know, we were cooking and cooking and cooking at the early days and then after everybody kind of got on with their lives, I found myself in something of a vortex. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to get the help that I needed from a really amazing doctor. Because mm. I didn't know there was it was a, 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 a disorder. Right. I just thought I was disgusting. Oh. I became, you know what I mean? I, my grief turned into 
self-loathing, yes, really, yes. to be perfectly honest. And I didn't know what was happening. And somebody took, got me to this incredible doctor mm. who explained to me that I developed an eating disorder and explained to me what was happening and took me to a rehab for, like, two months for mm. free. Mm -hmm. This place was like three thousand pounds a week or something. This man, he was like an angel. I swear, my brother sent him to me, yeah, yeah. and he d helped me yeah. understand what had happened. And when I came <laughs> out of there, I started to step towards the things that had brought me joy and joy, but 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 language mm. because it's my language. It's my secret language. It's my language when I don't know how to find the words. And the, the things that are deeper than words, words, words aren't always the best way to, mm. to, to connect to other people or to, uh, to exp express to other people what you need them to know, mm. what you need them to feel. Sometimes mm. it's on a plate and yeah. sometimes it's in the pot. You know, I always talk about that amazing book, um, uh, Like Water for Chocolate, yeah. Laura Esquivel. Yeah. And there's yeah. the moment, that, do you know that book? No. And there's the moment where there's two sisters and one of them... Has to, one of them is marrying this guy and the older sister is in love with him, but the family are making this just very quickly. Family are making the younger one marry this guy and the older sister is heartbroken. Mm. She's grief stricken and she makes this wedding feast and she cries, she cries yeah. into the wedding yeah. feast and they eat this food and it makes all the guests throw up <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, because her pain oh, is in the food and I always think it's such a brilliant metaphor that yeah. because yeah. it's, it's but it's, like, a, it's a real thing it's like the intention say, yeah. with which you yeah. make the yeah. food yeah. is yeah. everything if you're vexed if you're yeah, vexed bad if you're in a yeah. bad mood you make angry food you yeah. make angry but food, not, food so you know, mm. and when so, you're in grief you make yeah. sad food you make food full of longing and full of a uh, broken heart you know exactly. so I think it takes a while to get back into you. It took me a while. And when I did, it was like somebody put the lights back on. It was like the sun had come back out. And I knew that I was on the road to being able to be myself again, you know, mm -hmm. but it, it took a long time. And I was so grateful mm -hmm. to have that because not everybody has a thing. No. Yeah. Yes, not everybody that has they a can thing. access. Thing. Not everybody has a way of <sighs> holding on to the yeah. life raft and that yeah. was my it was my life raft Aye. thank you both very much um minister Jefferson. yes you made me very happy that's nice isn't it that's nice <laughs> no, no, it made me very happy i should tell you why because i might look cool and chic <laughs> but i'm a nerd and Melissa Thompson, I'm a real nerd. And in this book, <laughs> Jamaica's history. So please, if you want a kind of, if you don't want a, like a heavy tome, motherland, you get Jamaica's history. Why was it important? <coughs> My question to you, why was it important that you gave so much? I don't think it was too much. It could have been more. Why was it that you gave so much? Why did you feel that was so important to give so much of Jamaica's history? Because you really kind of break it down, and I, I think it's 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 because for like for me growing up, obviously my my dad is Jamaican, and I grew up having to seek information. It wasn't it wasn't taught to me. It wasn't widely made available, and the food of Jamaica is so heavily entwined in its history. And I know you could say that about kind of so many different cuisines around the world, but that the, the food of Jamaica is like inextricably linked to stages of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a dish, you can have like Escovitch fish with bami, and on that place, plate you've got like kind of like the Spanish Spain Jews, you've got um, you've got like the indigenous, the Taino um, with with the bami, mm -hmm. and 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 and, and it, even in bami, for me, I, I still get this kind of shivers thinking about it because so few of those people survived what the Europeans did, what the Spanish did, and yet this dish. Like it's still enjoyed today, and and I find that incredibly powerful. That mm. food, like it, it, it kind of it's it, it is survival, but also how it survives to tell the story mm. of people because it's their ingenuity, right? So like you know cassava, um, especially like kind of bits of cassava, like it can kill you, can right? Kill, yeah. And so I mean, so I mean, like fair play to the people who kind of stuck out with that after you know after <laughs> like watching people drop dead. And people, Aki, yeah. you guys eat Aki. Yeah, and Aki. Nobody else eats Aki apart from yeah. Jamaicans because of that red bit. Yeah. <laughs> I 
I mean, know. exactly, right? Because like, if you don't know, so ackee, you have to wait for it to open naturally. So, and you know, and some people, like some Jamaicans, won't buy ackee because they don't trust that someone hasn't prized it, prized it open. And I mean, I'm, you know, fair play to those people to be like, okay, right, I, would, I mean, I would walk away, right? Yeah, I'd be like, like, nah, you're all right. And then like, someone obviously was like, oh, but if we do this to it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be okay. And, and, and also, I mean, you know, the, the, the history of Jamaica is told kind of, I mean, you know, I did a lot of research here in the, in, mm. in, in the library, and the history of it is told in places, but to have it, like, I wanted to read the history alongside yes. the recipes. Yes. And, and it was a book that I was looking for, and there are some amazing um, like Jamaican cookbooks and, and, and cookbooks that cover kind of the wider Caribbean. Um, but I, I really wanted to have the history so people kind of, like for me, context is, is, is everything. And, and when you know the background of something, when you are informed um, about it, it just tastes like yeah. that sweet. And what I'll say really quickly, so I, like, I, I write BBC Good Food and I once did a column about people's different comfort food around the country. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to a woman um, who told me um, about, uh, she was a Ugandan woman living in Cardiff and she told me about Matoke. I'd never heard about Matoke. Matoke is like these kind of like, b b in, the, in the banana family, they're like really hard to like peel. Um, oh, like, oh. And, and, you, and, and you cook them and then you like mash them down with banana and typically serve it with like a kind of peanut stew, right? I'd never heard of it. And she's telling me about it on the phone. And I'm like, oh my God. Like the day after, I went down to Peckham and I was saying, is this Matoki? Is this Matoki? <laughs> and eventually they were like, yeah, so look online for a recipe. And I made it that day, right? And, and her like, talking about it and how it, like, she couldn't have it very often because she can't get the bananas like in, 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 in Cardiff. And, and I ate it and, and her love of it had like, had just like rubbed all yes. over me. And I wow. ate it, I swear, with the same enjoyment that she, that she told me about because yeah. like, it's just, that, that's the power of food, right? It yeah. is, it is. It Transference is it's an exchange. It's, it's yes. an exchange yeah. always. Yeah. Um, Andy, you also give, I mean, your, your book, which is such a beautiful book. I mean, they're both such beautiful, no pressure, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I've we're got all, this. <laughs> we're all sisters here. <laughs> yeah. Such beautiful books. I mean, I took the cover off because it will end up getting, you yeah. know, the cover is also very lovely. And but I also the... like that session so cover. Gorgeous. It's so That's gorgeous. my doily obsession. I love doilies. I love doilies. I love doilies. <laughs> I mean, they're the best, right? Actually, I've got every a, time I shoot, I was like, draw doilies! Draw I've got a doily drawer, gold, silver, got everything, darling. I love it. <laughs> Sorry. You walk away from here. <laughs> <laughs> and people will say, Marie Mitchell, more doilies, more doilies. More doilies. People know what doilies are, right? Wow, doilies, you know. Wow, <laughs> doilies, you know. Um, but my, my uh, younger son, when I was kind of preparing and said, just preparing for this. He said, oh yeah, that lady. Like, we don't really watch TV so much, but he said, oh yeah, that lady. Nice eyes. Oh. Yeah. That's oh, that's nice. so nice. He doesn't say a lot. Oh. <laughs> so when he says something, it's Tell usually means- Thank you, darling. Uh, he said, that. nice eyes. Nice. Um, so your book is more Pepper Pot Diaries, more memoir, you know, well, diary, diary, but you know, you give us a lot of little family. Um, oh, by the way. Your cousin, uh, Baden Prince. Yeah. He and I are in the same writing group. I just oh, are like you, him. Junie? Yeah. He's, yeah. We'll chat. He's a fine You've got to watch poet. that one. <laughs> but, uh, oh, he's brilliant, he's Junie. Quite he's brilliant. Um, but yes, I mean, you, but you also give history. Mm -hmm. You also give history. You give beautiful context. You know, when you, one of the, entries that I felt that I was most affected by I mean at the end when you write about your brother Sean for sure within the book the great house the great house the great house so tell us a little bit so the great house I mean it's interesting hearing you talk about it Melissa because I think actually you can't write about food in the Caribbean without writing about history yep. because no, every can't. single thing on the plate has mm -hmm. such resonance and there's a reason. You know, you're talking about Bambi, you're talking about Bambula. Mm -hmm. I just went to Dominica and met a Kalinago man who was making cassava bread in the old way and wow. I was just like, oh my wow. God, I just want to stay wow. here with him. But the Great House was a day where uh, we went to this restaurant. It was like, we're going to this restaurant, the Great House. And I was like, well, that's I knew it was going to be an old plantation house, obviously, because that's what they always called the really big ones. I'm always struck by 
how the most awful things happen in the most mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful places. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, that beautiful juxtaposition, places, yeah. you know, all over the Caribbean and the American South, yeah. those beautiful trees, and, mm -hmm. and it's like actual horror is perpetrated in these Churches places. Churches with the slaves yes, down below, yes. and, you know, places like that. And the Great House is one of those places, you know, it's this beautiful place, it's something, you know, they picked an amazing spot, the view is incredible. And uh, as we walked in, I just was, I just felt the ghosts. I could just feel the spirits, you know, sometimes the air is heavy with it, you know. Mm. And we walked up and I just was thinking, imagine, you, you're just hauled there from, no, you don't even know where you are, you're in shackles, you've got some of those awful iron things around your neck and you're walking up this path and the path doesn't feel that changed, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a big old iron bell and people are going, isn't that beautiful? And I was like, mm, no, not really. I feel like, what did that bell signify to people yeah. to mm. get up and do it again yeah. and get up and do it again and you're going to get beaten and you're going to get raped and you're going to get broken and your families are going to be destroyed, you know. So this, when I went to that place, I was really affected quite heavily by it and I couldn't not write about it, you know. Mm. Would you read it? Sure, sure. As we roll up the drive, the gorgeous house looms into view and I get a sick feeling in my stomach. I feel the long shadows cast by the past. The ghosts of the enslaved Africans who were dragged here are swirling all around. I imagine how terrible it must have been to arrive at this place, shackled and beaten and frightened. I look to the left and I see the old sugar mill. It's crumbling now, but somehow I feel it still head up in part held up in part by the black bodies that built and sustained it and its bloody crop back in its working days. We're greeted at the door by the loveliest woman who ushers us to our table. We ooh and ah because it's a stunning place and we do so too as we pass on, as we pass an old heavy black iron bell. What was it used for, I wonder? to signal to the tired, broken bodies that they must get up and start the torturous day all over again. It brings tears to my throat, an inescapable sadness from the heavy weight of the history, a most terrible juxtaposition. But then, but then, hold on to it. And I read that and was quite affected by it too. But then you go on to to really kind of talk and you write very beautifully, very compellingly to my mind about how we have to kind of change it around and go yep. into these spaces and, you know, yeah. I do, I do feel there's a project that we're doing with the Oxford Cultural Collective actually, um, with Lloyds Bank. Mm -hmm. And Lloyd's mm -hmm. underwriters. They, yeah, they, they, they were the people who, pay, you know, paid, they, they insured the ships. Yeah. But they are one of the companies that are taking verbal responsibility but actively trying to do new projects to mm. change the way we all interact together. Mm. And this is, to me, this week we have two choices. Mm -hmm. We can either sit in it or we can change it. Yes. Yeah. And I'm a very proactive person yeah, yeah. and I don't like sitting in shit. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, well, you, you're going to smell shit all the time. What a terrible way to live. Mm. So we have to change the future. Mm. And we can only change the future if we take responsibility for the past and understand it, shine a light on it, yeah. and honestly talk about it and then do things actively to move forward. Yeah, there has to be honest. Did you want me to read that? The, yes. From here? Yes. I have Thank a you. feeling of needing to stand tall for those that have come before us, our elders. A feeling that this is our now and that whatever we do, we shall carry them with us in our hearts, pull our shoulders back and be proud that their blood runs through us and that we can give them voice and spirit. I think of the amazing and inspirational black chef, Mashama Bailey, I know, don't you love her? I'm oh, obsessed with her. Thing. She's I love, just I love the when best. food people talk about other food people. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> I'm like a sort oh, of ridiculous <laughs> fan girl. I like lose my <laughs> shit. Uh, she runs a restaurant called The Grey in Savannah, deep in Southern America. It's an old segregated bus station, a place where her forebearers would not even have been able to set foot. The image of her, proud, black, elegant, beautiful, and bursting with talent and heart in the middle of that place is indelibly imprinted on my mind and I take heart. This is how we honour those who have come before. We cannot change what has been. 
but we can shape what is to come. And I feel a powerful drive to do just that. We can reclaim these spaces and work with them. We can cook there, eat there, work there, find joy there. It is, to my mind, actually imperative that we do. Mm. The relationships of the past inform, but do not control who we are now or what we do next. The food that we create is a vessel for liberation and joy. Mm. It can be healing. It can bring together the checkered past to create a unified future. Yes, mm. I believe that food is powerful in that way. Yes. And while, you know, doing the prep and reading the book, I remember kind of showing this bit to Polly and we were both kind of like, <gasps> you know, feeling all, <laughs> yes, sort of shivers and, yeah. Really it's, it's, really. it's really interesting writing a book. The, mm. Just the process of, because it's such an in introspective thing yeah. and you have to go so deep into yourself. You know, it's you're very, talking yeah. about... Actually, it's so challenging at times because you, mm. it needs to be your truth and it needs to be honest for it to have the impact and the, yeah. the mm. genuine mm. connection that you want it to have. Mm. But then once it's done, it's, such, it's quite a slow process. Not the writing so much, but the, you know, the process of publishing and all of that. So by the time it gets out, I've forgotten half of the things <laughs> yeah. that I'd written in some ways. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. interesting to read it back and then it's... Fascinating to see how other people connect to it and what they get from it. It really is like your baby. It's like a child that is giving birth to you. you feel <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, well, totally. And I think it's part of it also because you are dealing with, with a lot of trauma, right? Yes. Whether it's kind of like historical tra like trauma, like cultural trauma, yes. personal family trauma. And so I think part of the kind of forgetting some of it is like self-preservation. Yes, otherwise, I know what you mean. And that's also why I find it incredibly difficult to write as well. Mm. It's, it's oh, I like the writing. It was the um, measuring... <laughs> Amounts of food that's yeah. harder for me. <laughs> I, the writing, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, what is a, a hand? You know what I mean? And, I, and then I would I'd, start yeah. a recipe and get halfway through and think, shit. I know. I didn't measure the sugar. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? I'd be like, oh, I'm so clever. I'm so like, oh, I'm doing it. And then I realized I'd put three things yeah, in. Like, oh, I think, oh no, that needs some of that. No, damn, I didn't measure it. But it's, it's very kind of, I mean, I find oh, certainly the Trinbagonian experience of cooking and so on. <laughs> like to ask, like I went to Berlin one year, like some years ago and made curry. I did a curry chicken, you know, like we do it and so on and other things for my cousin. And then I, we had a dinner party. And then months later she called and said, cousin, I'm having another dinner party and I want to do this thing. And she was asking me what I felt well, like, I felt as though I was in math class. She was <laughs> saying, well, okay, but yes, but cousin, how much did you, and I'm like, Christy, Anna, a piece. Just all get, yeah, just a like piece. a bit, yeah. a handful there, and a bit a there. A pinch of this, a dash of that. Yeah, she, yeah. And she just <laughs> all like, come on, we need the. How many tablespoons? Yeah, yeah it was like a lot. lot. How I much? How so are we hard. doing for Eight. time? No, same. We've got twenty minutes. Yeah. Oh my God, Melissa, I'm going to ask you to just read and just say a little bit about. You know, you talked about your dad being a bit ambivalent about going back. And yes. You just talked about it being hard to um, to write. So this bit here. And then would you just say a little bit about that? Because yeah, sure. You, yeah. Okay. So and you can contextualise it. You can. Um, Dad has always been ambivalent about travelling back to his island, given his painful memories of growing up there, and we never pushed. In the absence of facts about my family tree, I filled in the gaps with the things I did know. It brought me comfort to think of my ancestors eating the same foods across the span of different generations and different continents. Our shared culinary history was and remains precious to me. Mm. And so your dad, but but in going back, I mean, and he did go, but it was like a family, yeah. It was a very I mean, fraught trip. Very, <laughs> you, I mean, there were a yeah. lot of arguments. Um, yeah, I think like my, my dad, he really suffered um, in Jamaica. So his parents left, his parents came over here kind of in, in the Windrush and, um, and he was left with his, um, his grandma at first and she was lovely. And then when she died, my, my dad's um, father claimed him. Um, and just like abused him really, um, and my dad like only recently I heard my dad refer to himself as being a farmer, um, mm. um, and and this is from like the age of what three until he came over here uh, here at nine, so had no formal education until that point. The first time he ever wore shoes was on the aeroplane coming over, Goodness. and um, and his 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 um, granddad and his granddad's wife, because it wasn't his um, biological um, grandmother, just abused him and were, and really serious physical abuse and. Um, and so, 
like and, and, and it's quite I mean it's quite painful to have to like hear that from your dad my dad my dad isn't kind of the most emotional of people and um, although I think we all do as we get older so like a bit like seeing your dad like kind of like talk about it and like and, and cry and recently we all went for like a big counseling like family counseling session and um, and and that was actually started by this book because um, my dad, I was asking for photos of him and he sent some photos to the family WhatsApp and I was like, oh, cute. And my brother was like, these aren't cute. He was, he was like, he looks traumatised. Mm. And my dad, like, he's just like really kind of like smart, kind of like preparing for the trip to come over. And, um, and so then my, my brother kind of reached out to his, like, sort of his, his kind of circle and was like, you know, we need someone like, is, is anyone know, like a therapist basically who's got, because my dad, they had a conversation. My, my brother was like, traumatized having heard it and I was always saying that my dad I'm, I'm going a bit off topic but no, kind of no, it's no, like really. it, it's um it's just I guess this idea of like kind of yeah these these things which don't hadn't ever been sort of spoken about at length and I didn't know the detail but I could tell that my, my dad was still suffering mm -hmm. and um and my brother was like I now see what you're saying and so can we have this whole you know this whole thing and he kind of spoke a bit a bit about what he'd experienced as a as a, as a child and I think um he you know there's lots of it and I think a lot of his memories of Jamaica were painful memories and I mm. guess as being of a different generation you know I kind of take on a bit of that but so we went as a family it was still quite fraught because it was really emotional but we went back to like where he grew up and there was like my, like his horrible grandfather had like he was a baker and like he was known for his bun and um and so we saw like it's kind of like tiny shack and and the, this the river down at the bottom where he, they used to go um like fi like fishing for janga kind of crayfish but like my, my dad would like kind of grab them wow. with his hands and his cousin was still like living there and um and and it was kind of therapeutic but because I, I, I went back to jamaica like to research the book and i had the best time because i did i wasn't there in the nicest possible way with my family so i didn't have to take that kind of baggage mm. and um and i really want um to take my parents um back and i want my dad to go back and just see the beauty of jamaica mm. away from the violence that he experienced mm. yeah thank you i mean even though i mean and that his experience as painful as it was i mean he didn't let go of his jamaicanness because he kept cooking the food yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he kept yeah. cooking the food and of course you dedicated one of your recipes to first choice yes <laughs> there's oh. a very strong connection between first choice and me but oh. i've been sworn to secrecy here oh no so. yeah tell you me know afterwards. i'll tell you after this. okay 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 <laughs> i'll tell you sorry first choice wherever you may be <laughs> sorry but um and so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up soon, but I wanted each of you to share with us your top three dishes. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm gonna try the curried, oh God, the curried fried chicken. I'm gonna try okay. that. I'm gonna try that. And I'm gonna do your recipe on roti because I just oh, feel as a trend big one and I should know how to make it myself. That's a really nice, easy, it's a bit, that's a bit sort of between a roti and a parata. It's a cross between it, that one, oh. and it's easy. That's why I did it. But I met a Guyanese woman the other day a in proper, Barbados. Proper, proper Paris. I am going to go study with her. Yeah. Oh, nice. You know when someone's hand is just sweet. like, yeah. oh, Sweet, my. sweet oh, like, hand. She called Joycelyn. Mm. This woman, I swear to you, she was making lamb and chana roti. Ooh. Oh. I went in there, I went, what are you doing in there? And then I ended up in the kitchen, of course. <laughs> I was like in the back. I was like, do you mind, can I just? And you so spied I, on your mother-in-law. You will go to yeah, any Yeah, spied on my mother-in-law. <laughs> But she wouldn't tell the me. So they won't. People won't tell you that generation. No, they, they won't they, tell you. They, they always like that to the grain. Mm, the they want you to come back. They, 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 they want you to come back. They won't give their secrets away. It's, it's power so too. It's power. Yeah. It's, it's a little. Power. Yeah, it's a little power. It's a little power. It's good. They're allowed to have power. Have your power. It's all right. Still three inspired. top three faves. Mine are always changing, mm -hmm. but things I always go back to are my mum's roast chicken. Mm -hmm. Dad's mac and cheese. Oh gosh. Even though I'm not great with dairy, but I still love it so much. Me neither, but um, and actually this is not a meal, but mm -hmm. I love yum yums. We had this yum yum conversation. We were having this chat in the green room. Earlier. And they're like a comfort, a hard yeah. comfort food. So like yeah. I have to acknowledge my If you my can't love um, and if you can't make them yourself, apparently M and S yum yums. Yes. Like the donut yum yum donuts. No, there's some people that know. I can't have those things in my house. So I would just, they talk to me from the other room. Do you know what I mean? They're like, Andy. I'm not even gonna, I'm Andy. not venturing near your mac and cheese recipe. Oh, babe. Oh, boy. Top yeah. three, top three. Oh, God, it's so hard. It is hard, isn't it? It's stressing me out. You're stressing me out. Um, I, there's, a, there's a spice rubbed roast chicken with coconut gravy. That is Oof. banging. I love that. 
Um, ah! Oh, actually, bambula, which is something that I had discovered, which is like a bami. It's like an old Antiguan recipe. So it's it's like two bami, but in the middle there's um, like a sp uh, like a sweet coconut mm. stuffing that are good. And then I love dukhana which are like white sweet potato, fresh coconut, little steamed dumplings. You wrap them oh, in banana and you steam wait. them. And I, I'm going to have to have four because it's curry. Yeah, go for it. Curry goat. Curry goat. No, 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 curry goat. Can I add curry? Yeah, curry, but, curry goat, curry, curry chicken. I didn't want to prompt you, but that's what I read somewhere. You said you always go back curry, to curry. Yeah, curry, curry, yeah, yeah, curry goat, curry, curry yeah. chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Curry goat, curry chicken yeah. with dukana. With <laughs> because it's, and rice and peas, that's fine. I like Mine, I'm with roti. Roti and rice and peas. And roti. Put it all on the same plate. It's all on the same plate, right? And, and so, oh, plantain. Plantain. <laughs> all plantain. I've discovered this thing. Sorry. I'm <laughs> You're not sorry. No, I'm Carry not on. sorry. There's a, a Puerto Rican thing. So I'm really interested in that oh, Latin yes, American yes. thing. Yes. It's called mafongo, mafongo. And it's mashed green plantain. And I put a little bit of sweet that plantain really in it as well. Yeah. And then you, ma you make a mash with it. And then you make like a chicken gravy. Mm. And you turn it out and you pour the sauce on the top. Mm. Holy Mary, oh, mother so of God. Like, <laughs> God. Right? Yes. Like, it's kind of, it's like I was like, like what oh, is this new sweet heaven? Jesus. I am not a religious person. It made me pray. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I and mean. Thompson. Okay, so because because they did how many did you all do? Oh, that, was, that, that was that was at least ten. <laughs> 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 you might have all of theirs as well. Yes, yeah, of course. So I'm gonna have it. all of yours. Yeah. Yes. Oh wow. Um, put that on one plate. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm gonna have um, oxtail. No, yeah. yeah. not cooked by myself because like <laughs> someone else. I like my oxtail's good, but it's just oh, nice cooked by someone else. Oh, God, I love um, it. Oh, my God. Yeah, like curry chicken. Ideally, like my grandma's, but I'll take my dad on oh, my dad's akin saltfish as well. Um, and then, do you know what? Like a patty. Like, oh! Like, like, patty. Like, like finding a patty shop in an unexpected place, right? And yeah. just be like, oh, don't mind if I do, right? And also, it would be rude not to, and then going to get like a little cheeky patty. Patties don't lamb, count. Ideally. Patties don't count. No, they don't. No. Patties if actually don't count, so you can have one more. And, can and have also, one. I'll say a lamb patty, because I went to America, and I did like, I did an event there, and then, and then it's like, this woman came up to me, and she's like, why, why lamb patty? Like, why? And I was like, why? What do you mean, why not? What do you mean, why lamb patty? Because I think like in, in, in America, this is like in New York, and I don't think it was like a thing. Really. They need like, to get out more. Yeah, yeah, they need to. You can put anything you like in a patty. It's a patty. It's a patty. It's a patty. Wow. And then, and then, well. like, I mean, like, my, like, jerk, like, jerk pork, like, pork. Jerk pork, of course, guys. Okay. I know. Yeah. It's, it's not three. We're, it's we're not, not three. <laughs> we're eating well. Listen, yeah. can I just say, abundance. <laughs> <laughs> abundance. <laughs> Waving back and forth, abundance. <laughs> so, audience, Polly, have, have we been good? You've been great. Okay. Amazing. All right, <laughs> great. So, audience, do you feel nourished? I am <laughs> hungry. And hungry and hungry. I want oxtail now. I'm hungry. I love oxtail. I can't believe I didn't no. say oxtail. Oxtail is like one of no, my favorite. No, but you all share. No, clearly yeah, yeah, yeah. you all share. Yeah. 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 yeah, big table. So we're good. I'll bring the bit of everything. Because I feel a little bit panicky because <laughs> I missed out, but it's okay because we can. I can't know. Yeah. Actually, you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't. I, I forgot yeah, yeah. this has got I oxtail. I'm really vexed. It's all sharing is caring. It's all sharing. So now we throw it open. We throw it open to you, audience. You've been really wonderful, and now it's your turn to ask these glorious chefs anything you like. Food right. Oh, we've got a hand oh. there. Yes, lady. Do, is there a mic? Oh, yeah, there's a mic. Here, here they come. Here they come. Da, da, da. Oh. Exactly. Da, 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 da. Hello. There's lady in black and white there. Yes. Okay. Ah. Yes. Thank you. Oh my God, the lights, right? Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm really interested at the moment in how music history kind of uh, is similar to food history in its like oral pathways. And I was just wondering, is there any music or do you guys connect to music whilst cooking in, in any way? Mm -hmm. I've got a playlist on my book. Ooh. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just about, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> ideas, though. <laughs> ideas. <laughs> well, yeah, you're still timed on it. Um, absolutely, because food and music are inextricably linked, as far as I'm concerned. They come from the same place. You know, I used to write a lot of songs. Now I'm writing recipes. It, it, it's the same feeling. 
in my gut when it when the things happen because really it's about truth and music is only good if you mean it food is only good if you mean it okay. so mm -hmm. yeah and so many of my best and happiest food memories are you know dad mm. crap all week worst down the world sunday mm. yeah. sam cook's on brooke benton's on james yeah. brown is on probably jim reeves because yeah. you know no, it's sunday problems it's country sunday. music what's the yeah. matter with us uh you know so Patsy Klein, all of those things, cooking, delicious food, family vibes mm. and music and food to me are all in one little happy mm. like place in and my And dance, belly. for me, I often yeah, like, dancing. I'll break out in the middle of like mm -mm. something. Mm -mm. I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm often in this, this, when I'm having the best time, I'm by myself in the kitchen. Yes, mm. yes. And I'm then dancing like no one's watching. You do it when you taste. <laughs> It's a whole time like chopping get yeah, yeah. yeah there's a moment yeah. <laughs> it all it all yeah yeah so it's hugely in, in but when you're dancing like no one's watching and then you get caught like i did <laughs> <laughs> and my younger son came in and he said mommy how come you can go down so low <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole story there another question and child just, mind just your business as well just to say i think like for me gr like growing up in weymouth where there, there weren't very like, many jamaican people yeah. it was always food and music that kind of like subtly provided answers as to like, because when you're young, you don't understand, you know that you're a bit different, but you don't really know why. And my, pe my dad, my parents wouldn't really talk about it, but music mm. made sense. I'd always go and listen to like Jimmy Cliff, because that was one of the, like the harder they come, the soundtrack that my yeah. dad had. And and some like songs are joyful on that soundtrack, some are like deeply melancholy. Mm. And, um, and and it would always kind of like quite an unsettling feeling. So it was always like food and music, I think, that kind of provided mm. like some sort of weird answers, even though they weren't explicit, kind of just explained something. That's really interesting. It's like, and it connection to other people yes. of colour when yes. you're yes. isolated and you you know Jimmy Jimmy Cliff is singing Many Rivers to Cross yes, exactly. yeah. or you hear Bessie Smith singing something at heart like from the bottom of her yes. soul and you're like oh my god I know yeah. what I know the feet you feel that pain somehow, and you, you, really? always you know that pain but then yes. you can't it, it is always then not, articulated yeah. in a song that resonates so much and yeah, yeah. it gives you understanding yeah yeah, yeah. And a glass of red wine. <laughs> um, well, not when I was 12. <laughs> no, no, no. more cider. Oh. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but you British children. <laughs> you British children. You British children. I mean, that is a thing, though, for, like, you know, parents of our generation who, you know, they came to this country because they wanted to bring, you know, a new life and opportunities for their children. And then they had a bunch of English kids yeah, 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 who yeah. wanted to go out and drink cider. And they were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? That was a, that was a different chasm to, yeah. to, to a problem to overcome yeah. for my generation. You talk sure. about that coming together of yourself, the British side and the Antiguan yeah. side, and that's really good. Please, please buy these books. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had another, I think we had, okay, so we have two people here, one, two, three, third row, and then was there somebody up there? Yes, There's that lady, yes, and you've got the mic. Um, are there any foods that you hated when you were kids and that you've sort of learn to like as adults? And how did you learn to like them? <laughs> I mean, everything for me. No, genuinely, oh, I, yeah. was, I was a horrendously fussy eater. Mm -hmm. I'd have pizza, but my parents would buy me like the bases that are like solid <laughs> and I would have ketchup on it. Cause I, ref but, Cause I refused to have tomato sauce. Like I'm basically the whole world has come alive for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think what I just hate. I mean, I, like cooked in, you know when t tomatoes are cooked and the skins go all wrinkly mm. Mm. and I still hate that it makes me heave I can't deal with it at all it just freaks me out so I hate them then hate them now probably hate them when I'm dead <laughs> 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 but I've, I've always sort of been quite across the board mm. in kind of eating stuff I kind of went through a funny phase in the middle when I realized that Sals was actually a ear <laughs> I was like, that's actually an ear. So when you say pig foot, it's no, actually a, it's actually yeah, a foot know, then. It's not, it's not a turn of phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a foot. I mean, I mean, they're literal. They're so literal. literal. So I just thought pig foot was a no. thing. I'm like, oh my God, it's actually a foot. It's a foot in your, in your So bowl. that traumatised me. <laughs> and it's now like I'm over foot. it. But now I'm what over it. The little you know, bones in, in the bottom of the pot. You know, when you're in chicken Barbados, foot. they say you are lean our features. Uh -huh. And I'm like bit of both, oh. <laughs> bit of both. So I'm all right with it now. But it was a bit of a thing when I realised they'd been feeding me all <laughs> <laughs> bits. And stuff. But that does fascinate me because 
what we managed to do with the, all the yes. bits that nobody yes. else wanted. The That's African ingenuity, hand, the yes. African as hand. You say in your book and as Jessica B. Harris. As Jessica B. Harris hand. was it, the African hand. And, you know, to Kitchen. me, I find it quite moving. You know, you're talking about the Bami and thinking about how many hundreds and hundreds of years people have been cooking that. Yes. The fact that we managed to make glory Mm -hmm. from nothing yeah. and to feed each other beautiful things when we had nothing and we were being tortured. It brings tears to my mm. eyes because it's mm. like the greatest love of all. Yeah. Mm. Being able to make a pot from nothing and turning the, the, the throwaway rubbish yeah. into beauty. So I've got over myself and I'm eating the foot. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling bad now. I'm getting the foot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat a foot tomorrow, damn it. <laughs> Um, oh my God! Like so much. Like, like, I mean, not as not, not as extreme as um, as Marie, but um, so uh, like as a, as a kid, my brother and I devised ways to sneak stuff off the table. So we'd get like the kitchen towel, and we'd be like, "Yeah, right, yeah." And then I'd like, put it under the table, and then like my brother taught me to go and take it to the toilet and, and flush it down the toilet. Wow. I remember once um, my dad was making like chicken and cashew nuts, and I didn't like the cashew. I, 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 I didn't I, I didn't get nuts in food. I don't understand it. So I, I like. Months later, my dad found all these cashew nuts under the sofa in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> and, as a Jamaican, made me eat them. Oh! oh! Yeah. Right? Um, Caribbean parents. Yeah. Love and that's and bad. That's yeah. so yeah. bad. Yeah. It's yeah. so bad. They were like, <laughs> like extreme. Oh, yeah. Waste nothing. They, yeah, no, waste know. nothing. But it was like teaching <laughs> that uh, found that they found green beans um, Ooh, down the back of the freezer. Um, no, because they were rotten, but I think I might have got a, like, a spanking for that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like loads of things. But the thing, like, so mushrooms was always my thing. I hated them so much. And I spent the last 10 years training them. Because even when I'm cooking mushrooms and I get like, that nice little caramelization, I'm like, objectively, I can see why um, yes. they would taste nice, but I just can't do it. So I've been training myself. And I'm, I'm pretty much there now. I do, like, don't give me a big mushroom, but if it's like chopped up, mm. I'll have to And it. do you have a thing? Because this is me with tomatoes, because I, do, I don't like them. But I know, I know when they're necessary. Yes. 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 Like, yeah, I yeah. understand when a dish needs them, yeah. so I will begrudgingly put them yes. in, yeah. as long as they've vanished. And I don't <laughs> <have to laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. They have a place, mushroom, just yeah. not on my plate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had two, yes, so there are two people here. Did you get the Michael? She's got this lady. Oh, there's another. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, um, just wanted to say that it's been great um, listening to all of you and the cooking that you're doing and how you've encouraged yourself to cook and others. Um, I was just thinking that the books, the different books, I would have loved to get them, but you know, choices is choices, not knowing which one to get. But I was also thinking it would be good to maybe put uh, books together. You could all write together about mm. your cooking. So or an event of... together. Yes. Yeah. Um, as long as I get to eat the food. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to just cook it. On it. No, we need yeah. to eat too. Yeah, yeah. We'd love to do I'd love to do I'm that. I'm putting yeah. myself there. I'm going to be I'll a pastor and just yes. I'll myself. do that. Yes. I'll do that. Yeah, man. Nice. Maybe, maybe also a cooking class, um, because maybe there are people not being told how to cook or they've never really been encouraged, you know, and they want to maybe cook and um, upgrade their cooking. Mm. So I was also thinking it would be good for all the different food you're, you've been cooking. You could make a, um, like a, a, co a course or a cooking class. Maybe you could plan or get together to teach people or empower people to um, participate as well as your books. Right. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thank you. You're all super wonderful people. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, you yeah. thank you so much. Kind of cute herself. Um, we <laughs> have two people down here. Oh, my gosh. We have two people oh, here, and we have two minutes. So use your time wisely, people. Got, got Quick one. Just drink water. Just drink water. Yeah. Um, Andy, my mum has is uh, mastering roti for 50 years and she's from Guyana and my dad's from Barbados so when I tell her about Joycelyn she wants to go and know her name where mm -hmm. she is can I have more Joycelyn details Joycelyn is she's just outside Spitestown and it's called Roti Den yeah. and this woman can cook I mean like cook like serious she makes your lip go beautiful <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean she makes you pull a funny face. The woman, and she's so lovely. Oh my God. And she makes the best tamarind juice. I mean, oh, it's, it's just yum. the spot. It's, 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 it's the one. Yeah. Last um, question. Thank just, you. Just wanted to oh, second uh, 
com the comment about best best talk ever. So <laughs> I've cried and laughed in the equal oh. measure. So oh. for that. Um, on the point you're making about uh, measurements, did you at any point w when you're speaking to the publishers, did that conversation come up about pinch of this, punch of that, as opposed to <laughs> 20 grams of this, 30 grams of that? Because I'm I'm quite dyslexic with numbers, mm. so actually. Punch of this is pinch better of that. for you. It's mu mm. much, much yeah. better and much more yeah. intuitive with texture and. Yeah. But the the problem with that is, it, I, I for, for me, what I really want is for people to get confidence in the kitchen. So I want those recipes to be like a starting yeah. point. It's like a leaping off board, and then I want you to be able to go. Do you know what? I'm not in, that into cumin. I'm not going to put any in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So if you make it quantifiable for people then it's, it's, it's better for them to gain confidence. Mm. After they've gained confidence, then they can start getting a little pinchy, punchy, mm. oh. lick a piece, lick a piece. <laughs> 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 you just like a little, but they, I think for people to, who are just starting to cook, and especially starting with a the cuisine they're maybe not that familiar with, I think it's quite important for them to feel like they're getting the rudimentary mm. uh, infrastructure. Mm. Almost, because it is like a sort of skeleton that you're building in, in, the, in the back of the dish, do you know what I mean? And then they can take off and, and pinch it, punch it, slap <laughs> it, I, do, I do like. think Caribbean food does seem to have eluded a lot of people. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Which definitely blows my mind, but that's probably because I'm in a vacuum where it's, I'm surrounded by it. But I think I was discussing this with Nicole, um, Nicole Richard. Yeah, I was like, just sisters, you know, sisters. No, but I panicked. I'm terrible with names. And I was like, hesitant. I was right. It's fine. Um, <laughs> partly, sorry. Um, and we were discussing the fact that people have been exposed to it. They just haven't necessarily been aware that they've been exposed to it. And I think that's the thing that I'm really excited about at the moment is that people are ultimately taking the stories and the information that they have and they're being allowed to share it with their voices mm. rather than other people. And then from that, people can understand that they've actually known about it for far longer. Mm. Yeah. And can I just add really, really quickly, mm. the, uh, I think the important thing, I think, with food from, from the Caribbean and from uh, like, uh, sort of across African countries is that they are kind of almost the last bastions of, of codification, right? So I think that codifying those cuisines is really important. Mm. And I think to have something that is unfortunately quite prescriptive which does take I think some of the magic out of it mm. but it's still important as a book and very I, I view motherland as a very much a starting off point um, and, and uh, one thing from my publishers so with my jerk recipe because and this isn't about quantities but it's about how you use ingredients with my jerk recipe um, I was like when you start off with pimento you need to smell the pimento berries and if you're getting the other notes of like clove and cinnamon just use pimento but then if you don't get that, then add a bit of cinnamon, add a bit of clove um, and, 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 and kind of like have that confidence to add that. Because if you go to Sainsbury's and buy their, um, their pimento allspice, then you're not going to get the same as if you get it from like a, like a black owned Jamaican owned company like Jamaica Valley, who it's going to be proper or the guy in Brixton under the bridge outside Sports Direct. <laughs> you're getting, you're oh it's oh not yeah. gonna, it's gonna, in the yeah. little bag. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I went to get something there and he gave me more... Maureen's freaks, outside, go and have a word with her, she'll have a word with him. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to grab her. I will. Thank you. Nah, yeah, he get Anyway, but I forgot. <laughs> about but it's a great spot. I want to, first of all, I want to thank the audience because you all have been really, really a wonderful audience, really engaged and a loving audience. We could feel the love. And now I want to turn to... <laughs> <laughs> and say thank you three so much. It's been such a joy. It's been such a pleasure. All my nerves just floated away after oh, about the first 15 minutes. Now. Thank you. You were oh, like, yeah, that, I really enjoyed that. You oh, were amazing. I thoroughly enjoyed yes. it. Yeah. Like, thank absolutely. You so much. Thank you thank so you. much. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Was, was that not the best? <laughs> Just the best. Amazing. I really enjoyed it. What? <laughs> so I could, I could Unbelievable. Half hour these yeah. these yeah. women, yeah. wise, yeah. generous, yeah. funny, they got it all. <laughs> we had it all, and it was been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Brilliant, brilliant, Jerry. Wonderful conversation. Marie and Nicole Rochelle, you will be coming back next year to sign your books. 
but you, yeah, but Andy, yeah, and I mean, if you want to, uh, Andy <laughs> and Melissa, ho hoping that you will be going down to sign your books at sure. the pavilion. Yes. And I also wanted to just do a really quick shout out because you've been talking today about those who came before, and I wanted to give a shout out to Rosamond Grant, who's sitting in the front. Yes, Ooh. yes. Oh, she's cross. Yes. Rosamond Grant. Who's amazing Caribbean and African cookery book in pu published in the 1980s really yep. paved the way and is also available down in the pavilion Yay, and perhaps Rosamond you. will sign we some. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm telling you. She's here. Everyone thank can go you, and say you. hello. Thank you. Um, I would just like to thank a few. Oh, first of all, I want to say tomorrow is our Super Sunday food season uh, with six, seven events back to back. There are a few tickets for some events, so check those out if you'd like to come back and join us. I'd like to thank the Oxford Cultural Collective who partnered with us on this. And I just hold my hands up, Dom, you're here. I'm so sorry, your logo is not up on here. The Oxford Cultural Collective is amazing. Check them out. They are brilliant. Um, I want to thank the events team who've helped us, Jonah especially, who's aged about 20 years today. Um, Still looks great. The, he, yeah, he's, yeah, he definitely does. Um, the AV teams, Unique and Blue Box, but especially to all of you, an amazing audience. Thank Wonderful you for audience. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.